So the date is Friday, January 18th, and you are here at the Marionette Theater. And uh, please grab your seats. You're in for a special treat. And before we get too far underway, I do need to check in with my partner in crime, the man to my left here in the auditorium, Mr. Toppy Smelly. How are you this evening, sir? DJ, I'm excellent. I am so psyched for the movie tonight. It's one of my all-time faves. A round of applause for Mr. Smelly's arrival. Uh, shucks. <laughs> now, I don't know about you folks, but after that little last little venture to Pickle Hollow, I'm thinking that uh, Roger and Walt have some unresolved uh, issues, some PTSD, so there's probably going to be uh, a bit of counseling involved somewhere in the near future. Maybe even some tinfoil hats. What do you think? Maybe. It's not going to be easy. That, that you can count on because it's Pickle Hollow. <laughs> <laughs> Truly scrumptious. Do, do, da, do, do. Mm, scrumptious. Oh, ha, 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 hi. Oh, it's me, the candy counter lady. Uh, you know, that was always my favorite song. Truly scrumptious. Well, tonight we find out what happens when a British spy novelist writes about a magic car. It's got Dick Van Dyke, lots of Dick, fresh off of Mary Poppins, lots of Poppins, and the woman who replaced Julie Andrews and My Fair Lady. Oh, yeah. And uh, so we're watching the 1968 musical Jenny Jenny Bang Bang! Hit it, boys! What do you get when you take a dash of the silver screen? A pinch of the golden oldies. And a smidgen of streaming. It's time for Matinee Minutia with your host, DJ and Toppy. God, shucks. So, Mr. Smelly, we have a musical. This is a Matinee Minutia first. I guess so. And uh, we are brought here tonight by a love of film and television trivia of Hollywood and all the going on goings on behind the scenes. So this is not your typical movie podcast. No, sir. This is when we find out what Betty Davis said to Joan Crawford at the lunch counter. <laughs> uh, you speak of trivia. Yes, sir. That's right. We'll recap the movie a bit. Uh, we'll uh, we'll talk about it, but the main part of the shoe is going to be getting to behind, get a, getting to the trivia behind the movie. Yes, and uh, as we settle into our seats and we just start our uh, roll of the trivia, let's take a peek and see who's joined us tonight. All righty. Well, <clears throat> we have uh, our. Uh, uh, ace number one listener ever, Spanking B. Arthur. That's Matthew Burlingame, he of the uh, Chubbs Gone Wild. Uh, gays talk about gays. No, it's gay sex. <laughs> and, uh, oh, Spanking B. Arthur. He's he's brought these damn shows back. Um, so he's all over the place. And also, I mean, I don't know. He writes and he <laughs> I, he does everything. I I don't I, I don't know how he does it all. <laughs> and we have a lurker in the room, it looks like, or at least they haven't typed anything. Uh, it looks like <laughs> Romo might be in the room. Oh, hi, Romo. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. Well, DJ, <clears throat> this movie came out in 1968. What the hell was going on in the world back then? Okay, let's take a gander at the world in 1968, if I can get my screen adjusted here okay it so was, uh, in, uh, uh, Carl. so this is the world in 1968 and uh, let me set my timer here because i have a challenge to myself to get this in 30 seconds although i'll be happy it'd be if it's 60 so okay just, all right <laughs> i don't know let's try for 60 all right so let's uh let's up the ante here. I'm gonna do this in a minute, folks. So in 1968, 
on NBC Network Television. We have the debut of Rowan and Martin's Laugh-In. And that was, of course, the beginnings of many a career, including Goldie Hawn. We also have New York City's Madison Square Garden, that venue where all the basketball games take place and the uh, concert every now and then. And, of course, uh, a lot of boxing Let's see, in 1968, Congress repealed the gold standard. So, you know, um, all those years of being told that Fort Knox was holding the country's riches, well, the vault's empty now. Uh, let's see, also in 1968, we said goodbye uh, to some important people in our world's history. Mr. Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated that year, as well as... President JFK's brother, Robert, and they were assassinated only three months apart from each other. So it was very, um, uh, just a very grim year. Rounding this out, we've got uh, Republican Party nominates Richard Dixon for president, 60 Minutes debuts on CBS, Apollo 7, the first manned Apollo mission, was launched, and it was the first live TV, bro TV broadcast from an American manned spacecraft. So, and then yes. just to put it a little in perspective, uh, in 1968, uh, we have a whole boatload of films that came out. 2001 by Mr. Stanley Kubrick. We have Funny Girl, Planet of the Apes, Rosemary's Baby, and uh, in this basket of goodies, the feature film we're discussing tonight, Chitty Chitty Bang Bang, placed sixth at the time it cost $10 million. And it's estimated that it made only $7.5. Um, yeah, it's a funny thing, isn't it? That it kind of wasn't a huge box office success right off the bat. Yeah, you know, it, it's a family film, and it certainly has its share of big names in there. I mean, you know, you've got Dick Van Dyke, who's just been on Mary Poppins a few years before. And in fact, um, Chitty Chitty Bang Bang was made, or rather, actually, Mary Poppins was made while Dick Van Dyke was still on network television. So, um, and then you just got a, a mixture of different talents that were brought in. Uh, to d drive the different appeals, Dick Van Dyke. You've got Benny Hill, who was the resident England TV star. Uh, oh, he, you know what? Before you get into the cast, uh -huh. let me attempt a brief synopsis of the movie. Absolutely. Uh, so we'll just get into what it's about uh, very briefly. But you've got uh, an, uh, it's the, the time uh, that this movie is set is, we figure, around 1919, 1920. Um, it's definitely between world wars. And um, we've got, in England, uh, a, a professor type, sort of an absent-minded professor, who has two kids. We presume he's a widower and uh, he lives uh, in an old house uh, with a windmill and uh, a barn. And uh, the kids seem to have free run. They don't seem to be forced to go to school. And uh, they're actually living an imaginative life as children will do. Um, and their favorite place to be is in a junkyard where there's an old car that they've sort of adopted as their own and they sit in it and play and eventually uh, the father buys that car from the junkyard rescuing it from being destroyed completely he restores the car into the gleaming picture of steampunk fabulous uh, and it works and, and they go for a ride and suddenly, mysteriously, they discover the car has magic powers. It, it can float on the ocean. It can fly in the sky. And they embark on an adventure to end all adventures in a faraway place to rescue their grandfather, who has been kidnapped by a bunch of naughty, evil people. And uh, they 
end up rescuing <laughs> all of the captured children of a certain place called Vulgaria. And everyone lives happily ever after it. And uh, just to top it all off, uh, the crackpot inventor meets a woman uh, who falls in love with his children and the inventor himself. And they all live happily ever after. At the end. <laughs> Oh, uh, that, that, that kind of reminds me of short videos out in the web of uh, movie synopsis that are done with different characters. And one of them is, I, I think it's uh, Bunnies. You could watch little 30-second uh, synopses of movies. But yes, that that is Chitty Chitty Bang Bang in a whirlwind uh, Yes, play the... Uh, play the uh... Uh, what you call it? the trailer? Yes, that's the word I'm looking for. The trailer. Play that. Okay. Or I'll just it's sing. Uh... Hutch the... oh. <laughs> this is Caractacus Potts, inventor extraordinaire. Caractacus had a dream. He believed man could fly. At first, it was hard getting his dream off the ground. But Caractacus had faith and a beautiful sweetheart. Two charming kids. And an adventurous grandfather. Hold out, starboard out, push with a capital P O S H push. Then Caractacus invented a fantastic magical car. It floats, it flies. And it carries adventure wherever it goes. It took them to castles and palaces and to far off lands known only in lullabies. And watch your boat from harsh by it also took them into the clutches of the nasty Baron Bomburst, who ruled over the evil kingdom of Bulgaria, where children were imprisoned and happiness was a crime. And the only thing that could save them was laughter and music. Sweet, 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 sweet. Never before has there been such a gallery of marvelous characters. Dick Van Dyke as Caractacus Potts. Sally Ann Howes as Truly Scrumptious. Lionel Jeffries as Grandpa Potts. Gert Frobe as the nasty Baron Bomburst, Anna Quayle, James Robertson Justice, Benny Hill, Robert Helpman, and Heather Ripley and Adrian Hall as the children. Never before has there ever been such a magical musical entertainment as Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. Hi, Chitty, no, Chitty, anywhere we go. Chitty, Chitty. Continuous performances at popular prices. Direct from its reserved seat presentation. That wasn't even planned, folks. Now let's get into the cast. Okay. Um, you started that. Uh, DJ and I interrupted. Why don't you continue? Oh yes. So we have uh, we have Dick Van Dyke, of course, who is famous for network television and having his own Dick Van Dyke show, where uh, he uh, did five years uh, that sitcom with Mary Tyler Moore and Rob Reiner, and uh, let's see. Just two, he had uh, ended his five year run with Mary Tyler Moore on the Dick Van Dyke show just two years before Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. And uh, between 
uh, Mary Poppins and this. He did a total of five films over the course of four years. Now, Ugh. yes, he was a busy, busy man. Um, Dick Van Dyke served as a radio announcer for the U.S. Army Air Force before he got his start in uh, acting. As a child, he wanted to be a minister. His his mom was a, a very faith-driven woman. And uh, in 1974, after his run on the Dick Van Dyke show and several movies, he received an Emmy nomination for a TV movie, which at the time was quite important because he played a role that was very dear to his own heart. He played an alcoholic in a film called The Morning After, in which uh, interviews that followed, Dick Van Dyke admitted that for 25 years he had been battling an alcohol addiction. Which is so hard to believe because if you look at the dancing, for example, in Chitty Chitty Bay, I mean, you couldn't think of a more healthier person. But I guess, you know, he had his demons, that's for sure. And uh, long long battle uh, with just drinking way too much. Yeah, and uh, his castmate, who played Truly Scrumptious, Miss Sally Ann Howes. She's an English actress. Now, these days, Miss Howes is retired from public life. Uh, there weren't too many years difference between her and Dick Van Dyke. And, well, Dick Van Dyke doesn't do uh, many appearances lately, but he did have a cameo in the most recent Mary Poppins Returns that just came out in theaters with Emily Blunt. Now, um, Sally Ann Howes has dual citizenship, so that means that she can travel to the U.S. and to England. Uh, she turned down the role of Eliza Doolittle in My Fair Lady. She turned it down twice before she finally accepted the role, and she got more pay than Julie Andrews, who she replaced. Ah, um, well, well, yeah. So, yeah, she, she had a career on Broadway. Um, uh, DJ, why don't you play that clip of the interview with Sally Ann Howes? Okay. I think that, that might be four or five. Okay. Do you, um, you were, had you just met Dick Van Dyke on this or have you been Just first? out of the blue. Yeah. I mean, we were just thrown together like that. I mean, I just got the role. I didn't have to test for it, which was a joy. Because yeah. I never get anything I audition for or oh, test. really? Never. No. Never. No, no, no. I'm terrible. Really? I, yes, I get, I get kind of, um, frozen, you know, and I become terribly English. Yeah. You know, and I, and they think, who's this cold woman, you know, and I'm not a bit like that. I have a good time. But I never, ever win anything that way. No. So I was thrilled when they said I didn't have to test. So I got the role. Right. And then I met uh, Dick, literally rehearsing, and we did all these very difficult dances. I don't dance. Really? No, I really don't. I'm appalling. And Ed Sullivan always used to ask me to go on, and he would say, oh, she's a lovely little dancer. Get her to dance, you know. And I didn't. No. So I had all the chiffon on, and my legs would go like this, and I'd cover as much as I could. <laughs> but you weren't even dancing under there. No. So when they asked me if I danced, danced on yeah. Chitty Chitty Bang Bang, I said, yes, of course I do. <laughs> <laughs> and so then I had to go to one of the most torturous things in the whole world, you know, with my legs being bent and stretched and everything to learn how to dance very quickly for that toot sweet. Well, you know? that one, that song. All that pain came back when I watched it, you that, know. That song where you're on the music. Oh, that's my favorite. I have a clip of that. Have you? Yes, it is. It's the most difficult thing in the whole world. I, I really was very proud of it because each move was on a <laughs> thing, exactly you know, yes. Time. And uh, I did it on the set. And I was a bit nervous about it um, going on the set because it was that huge thing with about 150 um, extras and everything. And they put me up on this uh, little box and off I went. And I got it in one. In one take? In one take. We'll take a look at that one take. It's probably my favorite scene of the oh, movie. Oh, mine too. <laughs> <laughs> that was Rosie O'Donnell. Remember she had a show once? Oh, goodness. So, yes, um... Sally Ann Howes was quite the uh, popular lady on uh, stage and in films. And she was, as she mentioned, uh, a guest on Ed Sullivan. Now, and uh, in the, that time, in the, in the 70s, I want to say, she appeared on Ed Sullivan four times. Now, when you're asked back on some of those late shows, you know you're a popular guest because people don't get asked back. 
and uh, of course also a testimony to Miss Howe's talent was she was requested to sing privately for three sitting U.S. presidents. Well, she had quite the voice, and it was very on display in this movie. She had a couple of solos, and, uh, you know, she says she wasn't a trained dancer, but she certainly was a trained singer. And as it turns out, one of the interesting things about Dick Van Dyke is he says, I wasn't a trained singer. And I wasn't a trained dance choreographer. Hey, we're, we we were going to work with you. We're, we're going to you do some scurry things through their body, and we're going to take that and run with it and make something out of it. And they did. And you'll notice his his most uh, laborious dancing scene is me old bamboo, and you know for like a minute out of that number, he's not even in it because the the chorus takes over for a whole minute and you don't even see Dick Van Dyke, but still, I mean, he's in it. He moves great. He looks great. And, and he says, uh, you know, he admits that that damn number just wore him out. <laughs> that the choreographers just really, you know, took it to the limit. It took him to his limit. And I think he's very proud of, of what he did with that. Well, and, and I would say that that's a, a testimony to the talent of some of the, you know, the, the production team there. Cause you know, you, you could certainly have somebody come in who is a professional dancer and, you know, they just put it in their head of what this number is going to be like. And sure. Maybe one take is different from the next, but when you've got a team of people that work around somebody's abilities and make them look good, now that's movie magic. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, uh, speaking of that, and you had mentioned it yourself, that um, Dick Van Dyke admitted that he was not a, a trained dancer. And, of course, some of the uh, the most athletic scenes were like the uh, the one at the bazaar, the, uh, the Me Old Bamboo song. There was a scene in the film, and you mentioned this on the Smellcast when we did our commentary of watching the film, that uh, there was a long scene in the candy factory. They were dancing around with the carts and demonstrating Mr. Potts's new candy invention that whistles. And um, yeah. Dick Van Dyke actually ended up hurting himself in that number they were twirling around in the cart and doing backward kicks and uh in uh one of the making of uh documentaries he mentions the fact that uh, he landed and he felt something go pop and for the next few days perhaps a week or two uh they had to shoot around him not being able to you know dance and gyrate like the uh, the candy factory people <laughs> Yeah, that was probably their highest choreographed, most complicated dance number. It's beautiful when you watch it. It's done in about four to five very long takes. And when they get to the point where Dick Van Dyke is grabbing a, a tray on wheels, a cart, and he starts twirling around. I mean, you can see the strain on him where he's, he, he's, that's not trick photography. He's really whipping that thing around. Oh. And then he jumps on it. Yes, and, I was going to uh, say, that's, that's the thing that sticks out most in my mind is knowing that he admitted that he hurt himself during that routine. Y you wonder if they had other takes that they spliced together because he's standing on top of that cart. And I'm like, if the man just pulled a muscle, I don't think that any amount of adrenaline in the world would keep me upright. <laughs> yeah, seriously. Um, <clears throat> uh, let's see. I want to get back to the chat room because there's some things that Spanky's been saying. Mm -hmm. um, and he says uh, that I think that Neil Bamboo reminded of possibly of some of the rooftop scenes in Mary Poppins. Oh, yes, very much so. You know, it was a a bunch of, uh, well, not plain clothes, but, you know, everyday working class people, I guess you might say. And, uh, you know, the, the bizarre there, that was um, everyday people that were going there. I mean, we saw our share a kind of fancy people in Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. You've got Truly Scrumptious, who when we first meet her, 
she's coming to or from her dad's office and she's got that hat with the the um you know the veiled ribbon and she's got her her you know i guess you might call it a frock on and her car even looks like it's been freshly you know cleaned because there's not a spot on it and yeah. um you know i think it even had white walls <laughs> <laughs> yeah um but that was one of the cute little things is, is that when the kids when the inventor's kids are introduced they are wearing tattered clothes their faces are smudged with dirt and they run into truly smunches truly smunches <laughs> uh, they run into truly scrumptious who is you know about as clean and uh, uh, spring day-ish as you could be. I want to welcome in the chat room. I'm so happy to see her. It's Cronehaven. Uh, she's dropped by. Oh, excellent. And uh, we'll have a new tradition here that anyone who is new to our uh, audience here will get a round of applause. <laughs> welcome. There we go. Yeah. Welcome, Cronehaven, and we look forward to seeing you at Farpoint next year. Stay tuned for more info about the Mid-Atlantic Sci-Fi Extravaganza. Uh, oh, that next year, next month. I said next year? Yes. Oh, well, we're already in the new year. Silly me. You big I, silly. I guess I've been so, watching too much Doctor Who lately. <laughs> right, right. Uh, let's get into the director of this mess. Not a mess. It's not a mess. It's a wonderful movie. Uh, Ken Hughes. And ah, the funny thing is, and this startled the hell out of me, turns out he was miserable when he made this movie. <laughs> <laughs> he did not enjoy this at all. I guess nobody told him that his two, his two main stars weren't dancers. I don't know. I think I, I tried to find out and read, well, what did you like about it? Jeepers. And apparently this was his first and I think only musical. And it was just that he never had to sweat over a movie like he sweated over this movie. Hmm. And I think that's why he didn't enjoy it. It was basically way more work than he thought it was going to be. And as a result, he just wasn't prepared uh, to be that dedicated. And I think he did his job. I mean, no one had to step in and take it over for him. Mm -hmm. uh, and so he succeeded, but he just, he just thought, you know, I can, you know, his enthusiasm, he said, ran out long before the end. Oh, <laughs> So, well, and it's also possible. I mean, you know, when you're saying that he he was sweating, um, some of the info I'm reading about the film was that this was shot in the summer, so it was done in July in England. So, you know, maybe he wasn't expecting the temperatures they got, but um, that that that's no reason to be a grumpy pants around uh, the talents that brought you Disney uh, fortunes like Mary Poppins, the Sherman Brothers were responsible for all um, the majority of the musical numbers in Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. And uh, to quote Dick Van Dyke, this movie out Disney's Disney at the time. Right. And let's talk about the writing of this. And it was based on a children's book by Ian Fleming. So if you recognize that name, it's probably because you associate it with James Bond. And, uh, and that's kind of how he got known, and what he's mainly known for is is writing quite a few of the James Bonds, uh, James Bond novels, and uh, they were a huge success. Of course, they were turned into a mighty movie franchise that's still going today, and that must be a record. There's got to be a record. There's, I, I don't think there's a movie franchise that's that old. Now, before so, we continue discussion on the book. Uh, we are at the halfway mark, so shall we go ahead and do our little intermission, sir? Let's give people uh, about a two-minute, 25-second break and uh, go potty. Get a drink. Uh, psych yourself up for the second half. <laughs> well, you know, as as uh, Grandpa Potts in this film, and oh, that's that's a, I guess that's a, a an outhouse joke, Mr. Potts. Uh, he went to the little half moon house and then he was taken off by a Zeppelin. 
Yeah. Uh, it's a cute character. You gotta love it. Matt in the chat room just said, you know, there's not a bad song there. The music is, is great. And I agree. There's no, <laughs> they, they never made a mistake. They, they got every song right. It's intermission time, folks, so hurry, hurry, hurry. Step right over to our refreshment center for the most extravagant array of refreshment goodies ever assembled under one roof. Enjoy breathtaking, mouth-watering goodies, everything from a snack to a delicious full meal. At our refreshment center, you'll find a large variety of goodies to satisfy your hunger, your thirst, or your sweet tooth. So hurry, hurry, hurry. Visit our refreshment center now. So okay. we were talking about the book and uh, spy novelist right. Ian Fleming wrote this novel. Now he uh, he wrote it for his children and I did a little bit of digging and apparently yeah. it's still quite popular. In fact, you can fetch a hardcover edition of it of online and it's a, it's an illustrated book actually. And um, okay. some of the theater productions that have been done uh, about the original story include certain elements that weren't in the, the film release from 1968. And uh, he, if you can uh, dig up the cast recording, which is available yes. on certain services, you'll hear some of the things that uh, didn't make it to the film. Like the fact that since it's a children's story is, um, you know, is, is part of the traditional book release where you have little in there now in the uh, songs from the state the cast recording you hear that uh, the car will do certain things because it's a magic car but it will only act with manners you have to say please before chitty will do something okay that's that's in the novel in the book Yes, uh, and okay. in uh, in uh, stage productions of it as well too. Because oh, okay, so I thought that interesting because of course since it's a children's book originally, you know you always have the the stories that tell you, you know oh eat your vegetables you know get to bed on time that sort of thing, and this is supposedly telling children to say please and thank you. Okay, um, some of the things I found out. Uh, with Ian Fleming in this novel is that he had had success with 007. They were starting to be made into movies and, and he was digging that, but he had a heart attack and, and he had a long convalescence. And that's when he wrote Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. Uh, he wrote it because it just felt like a good way to spend his time as he convalesced, but also because his kid, uh, or children, I'm not sure how many had, all sort of complained because he wouldn't let them read 007. It really wasn't the material for children. And his children said, why don't you ever write something for us? And so he wrote uh, Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. And the novel is substantially different from the movie. Uh, there's no castle. There's no uh, goofy villains. There's no truly scrumptious. Right. Um, Mr. Potts and, is actually a married man in the original story. Yeah, and 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 what he focused on really was a lot a lot of what he would focus on in James Bond, which was the gadgetry. He he loved to talk about the the cars, little secret things, and the gadgetry, and also the places they would go, the travel that Chitty Chitty Bang Bang did. That's that's really more part of the novel. And despite the time difference, it would be about uh, two o'clock in the morning over there in merry old England. Our dear friend, Mr. Paul of the Shy Life podcast, Shy Yeti, has left us a message in our chat room uh, for the purposes of this conversation. Mr. Shy Yeti says, it's funny to think that Chitty Chitty Bang Bang, the story version, was written by the creator of James Bond and adapted for the screen by Roald Dahl, who obviously wrote loads of kids' books but especially in the UK, is known as the writer of some of the best stories of Tales of the Unexpected. 
And Tales of the Unexpected was a British television series that aired between 1979 and 1988. So it ran for nine years. And each episode told a story, often with sinister and wryly comic undertones, with an unexpected twist ending. So thank you for uh, leaving that message for us, Paul. And you can uh, also leave a message for us between episodes or even after you've listened to this one by going over to matineeminutia.com and clicking on Discord. Let's talk about what happened when they wanted to make it into a movie, DJ, and you've done some research into this, and the screen uh, screenplay was just co-written partially by the director, but mainly by who? Interesting story. So, Rold. <laughs> Rold, I It's Rold or Rold Dahl. I only I, know the... I don't know. The last name I know is, is unmistakably Dahl, but it's D-A-H-L. And yeah. that just puts an interesting spin on this, because you have a spy novelist writing a children's story but then when we adapt it for film you have a, a an author who's written children's stories so we take it even further into uh you know the nursery rhyme uh aspect here <laughs> and uh, of course Roald Dahl is f uh, famous for many of his more popular books including James and the Giant Peach as well as Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory, which, quite interestingly, Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory came out just three years after Chitty Chitty Bang Bang, and yet in Chitty, we get our first taste of industrialized candy factories. Right. Uh, when you catch this scene in Chitty Chitty Bang Bang of the interior of the candy factory, it's very steampunk, it's very industrial revolution, uh, styled. It's a beautiful set. And, you know, instead of the little maids in their dresses, you can almost imagine the Oompa Loompas. Yeah. So, it, you know, I, I half wonder if he was writing this and thought, you know, I could make a whole movie about a candy factory or a whole book. I mean, Right. And you have to wonder, I mean, uh, th this might be fuel for a future story or future episode for us, but I wonder if any of the candy factory props from Chitty were reused in Willy Wonka. <laughs> I, you know, <laughs> I, I'd, I'd be amazed. I, I'd probably not, but, you know, they were completely different styles of sets. But who knows? Maybe somebody who knew something about somebody and knew something may well, have put it in there just as a an homage well you know i i kind of noticed some of the equipment there like the conveyor belts that they had that were turning out the little the little chocolate covered candies in it for lack of a better term it looked like an old style typewriter where the fingers were lifting for the candies coming out on the conveyor belt now uh, i i seem to recall there's a scene in willy wonka that stuck out in my head and it looks like a machine like that but you know i've been wrong before <laughs> i don't know maybe <laughs> i don't recall it myself now uh, the folks in the chat room uh Cronhaven and 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 spanky matt blurring game they're gonna get a kick out of this so dj when you and i were watching this together towards i don't know after the intermission of the song there was a melody that kept appearing and we recognized it and we weren't sure what it was at first but we we quickly recognized it as the damn song big fatty plays at the <laughs> at the last day of every month <laughs> and and we and we heard it and i said that that's the song right that's Big Fatty's song, the Vulgaria song. And we kept saying, are they going to sing it in the movie? Like, do we just not remember this? What's going on? Well, they never did sing uh, the Vulgaria song, but we distinctly heard the damn melody. And so mm -hmm. upon further investigation, what we found out was that uh, most likely uh, that damn song was cut from the movie. But when they did this stage musical they brought it back and and so i i just didn't know i did not know the origins of of the vulgaria song i didn't know it had anything to do with chitty chitty bang bang and it was just funny when we heard that damn melody we said whoa i know that i know that melody ah. <laughs> 
<laughs> you know, and uh, the castle in that, that was just extraordinary. Now, I, I want to say that that was somewhere in Eastern Europe. It, it might have been in Germany, but, um, you know, actually let me look here because there was a little bit of trivia I wanted to mention about the actor that played Baron Bomburst. And yes, bomb, like, you know, you drop it and it goes pow. Um, oh, but it mumbles. Yes, uh, and and this is part of the story that's interesting because it's a story within a story. You know, they they have gone uh, on a day's drive, a Sunday drive, and they're going to go for a picnic at the beach when the tide comes in. Now, uh, you were saying when we watched the movie together and on the commentary available over at thesmellcast.com, dot com that uh, there was a little bit of a, a blurry effect, like a kind of a flashback effect. And then it uh, it became a, a storybook tale. You know, they, they yeah. had the ship at sea and suddenly our, our, our characters were in trouble. And uh, I am just looking for my cast list here. And I could tell you the actor's name. Let's see. Uh, who, which one? I got it right here. Oh, the the actor that played Bom, Baron Bomburst. Oh, e e e e I will just Wouldn't click you know my back button stitch. here, and uh, I yeah, will have the, I will have the name just shortly here. Let me click my back button. Apologies, folks. So um, I, now I've never really understood because, of course, um, the the Iron Curtain fell in the nineties. So, um, you know, by the time I was out of high school, the cold war was, uh, you know, a good portion of the way towards being over. So I never really understood when Germany was divided into East and West. How is it that Berlin was East and West, but what you thought would naturally be the communist side, the side facing Russia was actually the, the democratic side. <laughs> You know, that that's the goofball way. The powers that be after World War II carved things up. Uh, I oh. mean, that's really all that amounts to is they – there was just a lot of carving up after World War II. Let's see. I have almost got to that part here. Let's see. So... Well, I've got – while you're looking oh. for that, I've got a little more trivia. Sure. What? Um, I was just going to say, speaking of Julie Andrews, um, the, the truly – was originally offered to Julie Andrew, uh, but she she declined. So she had first dibs, I guess. They they thought of her, and that's natural because the two of them had just been Mary Poppins. Hmm. Okay. So the actor that played Baron Bombers, the villain in this, the the uh, the dictator of the the uh, foreign land of Bulgaria, and he wanted Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. He saw it from the coast when he was out on his his yacht and said i had to have that so he he sent his goons to go fetch it well the actor's name was gert and i want to say the pronunciation is frobe it's one of those european names where the o has the dots over it the umlaut um yeah <laughs> mr frobe actually uh was a German descent, and he was from the part that was, I want to say, communist Germany during the Cold War. And uh, for a long time, there was quite a bit of opposition to the films that Mr. Frobe was in, because in his youth, Mr. Frobe was a member of the Nazi party. Um, but it came to light that during his service in wartime, he actually helped a Jewish family to safety. And it was that family's testimony that uh, made him a hero and subsequently dismissed his involvement in the Nazi party. Hmm. Very nice. And so, of course, opposite Baron Bomberst, we have the lovely Baroness, and uh, as we said in our commentary, you'd have to look twice not to think that this was Bernadette Peters in the early days. Yeah, uh, true. And uh, they've got uh, one great number they do themselves. And they're very comical characters, very broad and very fun to watch. But let's talk about the child catcher. Oh, let's. Can we? Yes. Yeah. Shall I shall I cue our little clip of the child catcher? Let's hear the child. Well, let's explain him first. Okay. Uh the the kingdom, this weird place that's captured the grandfather and the children, 
well, eventually they capture the children. Um, uh, this the, the 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 kingdom is bereft of children. There's no children anywhere, and it turns out that uh, the Baroness uh, hates children, and she's ordered all of them uh, to be taken away in basically into custody, where many of them are, and and also many of the citizens have hidden the children in the very caves below the castle, and uh, uh, the Baron and Baroness have absolutely no idea about that but that's where they are and that's where they're being protected anyways uh when uh, the car when the car chichi bang bang arrives and arouses the interest of the baron uh, the uh, child catcher goes out uh, because he smells children and let's play the clip of the child catcher <laughs> Of lovely goodies for you. And all free today. Cherry pies, cream puffs, ice cream, treacle tarts. Treacle tarts. And ice creams. And all free. Come along, kitty winkies. Come on. But Jeremy, Trudy said we mustn't be just staying at Trudy some as well. Come on. Oh, ew. <laughs> Anyways, that is actor Robert Hempman. And uh, he, you know, had a wonderful time playing the child catcher. He had a, a, a prosthetic nose that was very long. And uh, he was dressed all in black with a black top hat. He was very, you know, I mean, weird. And uh, the fact is, he it was a ballet dancer. And so it, with that music, that, that, Da, 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 da. He's prancing along on the set, very with great agility, and uh, you know he he worked that into his character. And also, uh, 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 Dick Van Dyke had a story about him in that uh, there there was an accident when they filmed the end of the scene when the children were put in a carriage, and then the horse rode off with them and Robert Hepman was driving the carriage and it, it accidentally overturned and Dick Van Dyke claims that uh, that Hepman was able to swing out of the carriage and literally skip across the cat the, the crashing vehicle and, and Dick Van Dyke claims that Hepman did this with incredible grace Ooh. and much like a dancer uh, he, he just sort of if you can imagine it, just sort of somehow stepped just where he should as the cart was rolling and ended up st standing on the road perfectly safe. And he had eight more lives to spare. <laughs> I guess so. <laughs> now, uh, speaking of Mr. Heltman, um, you know, he was quite the creepy character. He was supposed to be the sort of the truant officer of the kingdom. Earlier in the movie, we talked about the kids skipping school, and this is a man who... It was basically the truant officer, but his role is just to to grab all children, basically. But um, the actress who played the daughter in this film, Jemima, her name's Heather Ripley. Of the two that played the children, she's the only one who actually continued acting after this film. Now, uh, her name is Heather Ripley. And in an interview, she revealed that despite the creepiness of the character, Mr. Robert Heltman was actually a very nice man. In fact, she said... That um, the only thing scary about him was that nose. Mm -hmm. Oh, I can imagine. 
I can imagine. Um, I also just read a little bit just now that Heather Ripley, uh, the little girl, said more recently that, that she had no idea that Dick Van Dyke was an alcoholic when the film was made. So clearly uh, that didn't affect um, the movie. As a matter of fact, the director, <laughs> coincidentally, the director couldn't stand children. And he was very awkward around children. And as a result, he was very hands-off with the children. And and both the actors that played Truly Scrumptious and, and Crack, Cracticus saw this and they took it upon themselves to keep the children at ease and be you know become friendly with them and you know try to get the best performance they could out of them because neither one of the kids had had experience in anything uh, before they did this movie and it just you know it's just weird that that both dick van dyke and uh the woman uh just forgot her name oh Salian house yeah, both of them realized, it, okay, I guess it's up to us to really make this work. And they, they did it by spending time in between takes, just being with the kids and, you know, really developing a relationship. So it's kind of impressive that the girl would say much later, I, I had no idea he was drinking. Yes. And, uh, you know, there's there are a lot of... Um, of uh, veins to the story of this for those times you know this is a, a period between world wars one and two and you know you've got the grandfather who's a little eccentric but of course his his son isn't very far off because he's the crackpot inventor but nowadays we would think back to the mannerisms of the grandfather as somebody who suffered you know a, a wartime trauma post-traumatic stress or shell shock and um, I did a little bit of reading on this. Now, it's interesting to know, uh, you know, the grandfather talked about going off to India for a cup of tea because, you know, he, he had his, his, day, his daydreams and his, his wanderings. But at that time, the story took place in the, the late 1910s-ish. Um, India had not become independent yet. They were still under colonial rule. In fact, it wasn't until the late 40s, so after World War II, that India became an independent country. So um, the grandfather, Mr. Potts, uh, his his uh, fantasies of his you know past service in India would have involved him riding on horseback through the country. And of course, one of the jokes that he shares uh, at the breakfast table is. Um, uh, you know, I, I woke up this morning and I shot an elephant in my pajamas and how I found an elephant in my, or how the elephant ended up in my pajamas, I shall ever I'll know. I'll never know. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, yeah. uh, just just a terrific character. And it's interesting to know that um, the actor that played the grandfather, Mr. Potts, he was only four years difference. Mr. Lionel Jeffries was only four years difference from Mr. Dick Van Dyke. So uh, certainly his receding hairline helped to uh, present that ruse. But, uh, you know, uh, not no, that but far this is, apart. This is the amazing thing, right? Is that, yes, there's a four-year difference, but he was four years younger right. than Dick Van Dyke. <laughs> <laughs> uh so that's that's just funny you know he he definitely could play older you know without mm -hmm. any problem but you know the other thing you said is 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 that is you know he liked horses you know but he had this wonderful walk in the movie <laughs> that definitely looked like he had been on a horse for way too long <laughs> right <sighs> I, I also like to think of it as the drunk golf course walk <laughs> Yeah, kind of. Yeah. <laughs> so, so we got to we got to wrap this up. But I wanted to find. Oh, uh, okay. Here it is. Uh, mm -hmm. The license plate. So there were two license plates noticeable in the movie. One was for Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. One was for Truly Scrimptious's car. Mm -hmm. And when we watched it, I I noted uh, that that Truly's car license plate said Cub One. Cub One. Uh, and I I just. You know, what the hell does that mean? But we found out, meanwhile, that Chitty Chitty Bang Bang had the uh, 
the license plate of Jean, uh, Gen 11, so G-E-N 11, and we found out that that was an uh, allusion to the word genie, which implies magic, and and Chitty G Bang Bing was certainly magic. But uh, I, f I did find out why Truly's car was named Cub One. Yes. And uh, that was the number for the producer. Mm -hmm. uh, that, uh, oh, Mr. Broccoli. <laughs> yeah. Uh, now, Broccoli, he, he produced many, many of the 007 movies. And as a matter of fact, this this was really an unusual movie for him to be involved with, um, but he was. And uh, it turns out that uh, Albert R. Broccoli, uh, his nickname is Cubby. Mm -hmm. So it was, <laughs> it was in reference to the producer's nickname, Cub One. Now, uh, we normally finish out our program by, by uh, it, our thoughts on uh, how we felt about this movie and whether or not we'd own a copy. But before we do that, I was just going to mention a point of fact. So 1968 was the year this film was released. And as I mentioned in the, the history of the U.S. at the time, uh, we said goodbye to Mr. Martin Luther King, Dr. King, that year he was assassinated. And I'm just reading on social media that if... Dr. King and Anne Frank were both still alive today, they would be the same age as Barbara Walters. <laughs> wow. So, Mr. Smelly, I'd like to ask you a question. If you were trapped in the woods, if you were off the grid, if you were escaping from civilization, would Chitty Chitty Bang Bang be in your overnight bag to watch? Well, I think for the first time on this little shoe, uh, this movie wins a, a place in my a little grab bag. I would take this along with me. Excellent. And I, too, would have to say yes, because any time I could watch something that has sing-alongs and youthful energy, it's a feel-good film. And if I'm going out to the middle of nowhere to be off the grid, I want to feel good. Sure. And this is a feel-good movie. It's, um, it's, it's wonderful. Uh, Spanky in the chair room said he saw it about a year ago. I, although I guess he didn't get all the way through it. But uh, uh, it's, it's, you know, I mean, I'm an adult and I watched it and I loved it. Um, and I certainly remember loving it as a kid. And, uh, you know, on that note there, it, uh, I was going to say, we've mentioned off the show before that um you know you don't have to have kids or necessarily even want kids to appreciate a children's story because you think to yourself you know what would i say to my younger self if i could travel back in time what kind of advice would i give and this just plays right into that a lot of these stories that we might have learned or watched or experienced as a kid definitely could do with a revisit because there's all sorts of innuendo and humor that you don't understand until you're an adult and then you see you know the the chemistry that the the parents have in this film for example and you know the daughter who's trying to live up to her father's standards he runs the candy factory so um toppy yeah. i'm going to go ahead and get that magic bag of coins out let's warm up the machine here okay <laughs> What do you got there? Open it uh, up for us. All right. See, the Chitty Bang Bang doesn't got all the goddamn magic. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. not supposed to swear on the show. <laughs> Body uh, We got some magic, too. And one of them is that stupid gumball machine. And I'm going to open this capsule. Oh, look at that. The next thing we are going to be doing is a 1990s television, television series. Uh, ooh. I liked it. Uh, we'll see if anybody else does. It was called The x Files. Ooh. Yay. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Now, Matt, Matt just said, is it V? Is it V, the miniseries? <laughs> oh, why didn't I pick that? Why didn't I pick that? I love that stupid show. Well, don't, bl no. don't blink and, uh, you know, we'll, we'll uh, figure out something for repeat, gu uh, repeat guests in our audience here. So uh, we are at the top of the hour. We're going to go ahead and say good night, Gracie. Good night, Gracie. 
Our next episode is going to be in two weeks. It's going to be on Friday, February 1st, and we will be discussing the 90s. I guess it's kind of an occult TV show, The X-Files. Mm, yeah, it's it's it plays with the occult, and it's also has cult status. Anyways, that's next time. Uh, we were super happy to see Crone in the chat room. And uh, thanks again for uh, Matt to Matt Berlinging for uh, showing up uh, once again. We're always happy to see him. Okay, and uh, just a uh, advance notice for those of you listening: if you stick around, we may have a special guest in the works for our Valentine's episode. Shh. Shh. A gentle breeze from Hushabai Mountain softly blows. Or Lullaby Bay It fills the sails Of boats that are waiting Waiting to sail Your worries away Thanks for tuning in to Matinee Minutia. Our show is live every other Friday night at 8 p.m. Eastern. Stop by univospods.net Click the tower for streaming audio and enter Discord for chat. Follow us on Twitter at Matinee Minutia. Question for a topic? Email us at matinee minutia at gmail.com. And of course, you can visit our website at matinee minutia.com. I have a voice. I have a voice. You have a voice. You have a voice. We have a voice. We have a voice. Unique voices in podcasting. Univospods.net.